Hello, and welcome to the Totally Shui podcast. A DC animated universe <laughs> podcast. We haven't really sorted out this intro, have we? Yeah. We never write anything down. We don't yeah. plan it. We just talk. We need to, but, you know. Yeah, do we? It is what it do is. we? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome back to the Totally Shui podcast. This week, we've got a little bit of news, mm. and we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics in life and that's pets mm. so luke do you have anything you want to say before we get on to the main topic of the show yeah so just a little tiny bit of news following up on last time where i talked about batman mask of the phantasm getting a 4k blu-ray release there is now a special steelbook version that comes with a reprinted mini comic adaptation it's available in the uk from hmv uh, I don't know about other retailers in other countries, but just have a Google for it for you. Wherever you are, look it up uh, and buy it. Because if they if this does well, then I have a feeling they will re-release even more content. And you too can buy Mask of the Phantasm for the fifth time. On a... <laughs> I was waiting for <laughs> yeah. that. Because uh, I, bought, uh, well, I had it bought for me on VHS. I bought the DVD. I bought the Blu-ray. Technically, I got the Blu-ray again in the animated series box set, and I bought it digitally. I was, yeah, I was about to ask you if you, I thought you would bought it digitally as well. Yeah, yeah, I bought it on Amazon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Give so, Bezos all their money. <laughs> try not to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that uh, HMV. I love the the name. His master's voice yeah, with the little dog. When the first time that I I heard that, I think it was your sister who told me that. And I was like, oh my God, that's so sad. <laughs> I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's get straight into it. Today we're going to talk about the pets. So we're talking Button Lou. We're talking Isis. We're talking Streaky. We're talking about those types of pets. Okay, so I've I've been a lifelong fan of Batman, especially you know the animated series, obviously. Hence, why you're on a podcast about yeah. the DC animated universe. <laughs> I've always thought Batman was very shui, <laughs> um, and also Batman Returns. Mm -hmm. So the uh, just the Batman that came out in nineteen. 89 or 1990 89 the Tim 89. Burton one yeah because see back then i have to apologize for this but i always think about the release of the vhs tape yeah so when i'm saying like 1990 i'm like that's when it came out when we put it in the vcr mm -hmm. <laughs> so bit a big fan so luke and i obviously being married and everything thought hey when we moved out of you know the in-laws house hey let's move out to our first apartment and it's just the two of us it's gonna be great everything like that <laughs> that lasted about 23 days <laughs> literally i think it was 23 days or something like that yeah because i worked long hours six days a week so mary was often at a, um you know on her own at home a lot yeah, and this is before, just a little bit before remote working came in. It was a long time. Was it? Yeah, it was nearly 10 years. So, so I was like, can I get a cat? <laughs> can I get one cat? Like, can I, it's fine. Sure. To be honest, how does that work when I ask you for something, Luke? Generally, I say yes. <laughs> no, it's gen generally, <laughs> generally, I've already said <laughs> i've already picked it out yeah okay so we said okay let's let's get a cat because luke's at work all the time and this and that so i started looking at cats we both loved luke's family cat monty well mm. we loved all of the cats there all of the ones that were left mm. <laughs> um and we loved monty so much he's very lovely cuddly generous with his time cat so when I saw a cat that looked very similar to him, I was like, hey, Luke. And I I, th I think I just forwarded you an email or something. Mm, you did. So I, I emailed this person who I don't even remember the name of the website now, but I found it off of website because we adopt, we don't shop. And he was like, oh, yeah, that looks like Monty. 
so the woman emailed me back and was like, oh, I have the brother as well. I was like, okay, okay, what does the brother look like? To be honest, I didn't care. I knew what my choice was going to be, my decision already. Looked at this cat. It was a little lovely, you know, 14 week old black kitten. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And then she emails back. <laughs> we emailed back and forth about four times. The first time was the initial request of like, I like this cat, la di da da like to adopt this cat. The second one was, okay, yeah, the brother. The third one was like, yes, I would like it. And then with that third email, she was like, okay, I know I said that the brother was there, but we also have the mother. Do you want to keep all three of them together? And then that fourth email was like, I'm coming there. Um, just be there. Anyway, so we, I decided, and then I told Luke and Luke was like, sure. Yeah. Because that's the thing with Luke and I is we both love animals. We love cats, especially all of that jazz. And we, we have enough room in our hearts for these, these critters. So when you adopt cats, a lot of the times you end up paying like a fee or it's not necessarily a fee, but it's basically you're paying a little bit towards their food and stuff like that. Yeah, the, their the, medical the, costs because yeah. Yeah, the mother had been yeah. spayed. So I'm, I'm going to be completely transparent. We paid 150 pounds for the three cats, mm -hmm. which I think is completely fair because this woman, you could, you could tell that this woman put a lot of care into these three cats. We did not buy these cats because they're not pure breed cats, but um, we did do that because it's, she did, you could tell she, she cared for them in the time that she had. Yeah. Well, she ran a cat shelter. So you're making yeah. a donation to keep the cat shelter. Exactly. Running. And honestly, I cannot stress this enough in my life. If you can have a cat or a dog or any type of, of animal that you're allowed to have as a pet, I, I can't stress this enough. Please adopt because there are so many animals out there. Um, so many critters out there that need homes. Um, and we can give them homes. We don't have to breed in order to get, you know, uh, the cats that we do have sometimes. Like, uh, what are they called? Um, pe pedigree cats mm -hmm. and stuff like that, which is fine to, to, to have pedigree cats, obviously. But if you can, I cannot stress this enough. I want to be the modern day Bob Barker and mm -hmm. also say this spay and neuter your, your animals. <laughs> mm -hmm. But anyways, so the cats that we had, to make a long story even longer, were Isis, which was the mama cat, Thor, and Apollo. Mm -hmm. Their original names were Thunder, Lightning, and Storm. So Storm was Isis, mm -hmm. Thunder was Thor, and Lightning was Apollo. Mm -hmm. So we gave them these names for... You know, they're, they're not obvious reasons, but there are reasons we gave them these names. And Isis is one of the most special creatures that's ever come into my life. Yeah. And yeah, that's the, the begin her origin story. Yeah, so yeah, the th we obviously named Isis Isis after the cat from Batman the Animated Series. That yeah. was that was my pitch, and then that's how we landed on like the the deity theme for the cat names. Yeah. Now the thing you haven't mentioned, Mary, is that the sh uh, the the woman from the shelter did not tell us that Isis was almost feral. And she hated her children. <laughs> yeah, she hated me too. Yeah, well, she didn't like me very yeah. much either. So, One time I was kind of dawdling with feeding her in the morning and she, <laughs> she scratched my ankle and I've got a scar yeah, there. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Like to this day, still got a scar. Yeah. So Isis hated us. So that was in 2013. So 2013, 2014, we just, the, the, the two boys were just like, you know, hey, we're just, they're not very... They're not cuddly cats by by any means. The the boys, they are not cuddly cats. It has to be on their terms. Yeah, um, Isis at that point was not a cuddly cat either. No, and she I didn't hear her purr no. at all. No, we thought there was something wrong with her vocal cords or the you know the cat equivalent of vocal cords because we we didn't hear her purr, and we now know why. 
is because she wasn't happy. She mm-hmm. wasn't comfortable, I should say. Not mm-hmm. necessarily not happy, but she wasn't comfortable. Mm-hmm. So we lived with this for about two years. I, I think, think she was... even bit my mother-in-law. She she, she did, yeah. yeah. And my nieces, if yeah. they got too close, she would bite and scratch them. Yeah, not too hard, though. No. It was more just to scare. Okay, so... I, in 2015, I had started working. Well, I had started working before that, but I had started working enough to where I was like, you know what? I'd like to go visit home. I wanted to go visit Oklahoma. I wanted to see my brother and my niece and nephew over there. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go. And I went by myself. Um, So Isis hadn't actually seen a lot of me, but she was so used to seeing me every day because Luke was at work like all of the time Um, because like we said back then he worked away from home and was was he was just very busy he's still very busy but busy outside of the home so when I left for Oklahoma what I don't I don't exactly know what happened because Luke probably worked the whole time but how do you how did she react was she just like she seemed absolutely fine she seemed the same as normal she wasn't very affectionate no. She was just kind of there. She'd kind of sit within close proximity, you know, yeah. but more than arm's length away, so you couldn't touch her. But she liked being around us. Yeah. So that was basically how she was. Yeah. She wasn't particularly affectionate, but you knew that she liked being in our company because yeah. she was always within She was like, what's up, guys? What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> so I come back. I think I'm away for 10 days. Yeah, 10 days. 10 days. Um, So two days of travel. So, yeah. 10 days all together. I come home. I put my stuff down. I go in. I take a shower. I put away some of the stuff I bought. Because, you know, America, you buy loads of... Well, I don't know. I, I bought loads of food back then. <laughs> uh, I got my PJs. And although it was still light outside, I was like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. Because I don't sleep. I don't sleep on planes very well. Um, so I was exhausted. I go into our our bedroom and Luke's laying down and we're going to watch a movie. I lay down and this cat Isis just literally gets right in between us. She makes me like crook my arm a little bit and she literally does that little circle. She laid down and I hear it for the first time. It's not loud at all at first. When I heard that for the first time, I was kind of freaked out. (laughs) I was like, what the hell? What's going on? But I did not say this out loud. I was just saying that in my head. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. This is so cool. cool." Yeah, it's taken nearly three years, but she's finally finally engaging with us. (laughs) And I, you not, from that moment on, that cat was my best friend. Yeah, she was. She used to do this very funny thing when um, I could tell Mary was coming home from work because we live, you know, a couple of flights up, a couple of flights of stairs. Isis would get up all of a sudden and then go sit by the front door and wait for Mary to come. Now she would hear Mary open the front door downstairs. And it's too far for me to hear it, but as a cat, she could hear it. Yeah. So she would wait for Mary by the door, and you know, she'd have a little cuddle with Mary on the floor for five minutes or so, not even that long maybe two minutes yeah. and then she'd get fed up and move on yeah um and i'm not saying that her personality changed completely because there were plenty of times oh, where God, she would no, yeah. she would slap us yeah like we'd just be walking past her and she'd just <laughs> bam slap I had so many leggings with just her little like you could tell by the five little holes there's like four or five little holes where her her paw was when she slapped me yeah um but yeah, she was a very she was a very loyal cat. Yeah, she was very loyal. And if she didn't like something, she would she would hit you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like move a cushion, she yeah. she'd come running in and be like, "What the hell's going on? Change, change." <laughs> yeah, I like that where it was. Slap. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. She was like that. Yeah. And then 2017 happens. In 2017, for both Luke, Luke and myself, really, I'm just going to say it because there's no other way for me to say it, it was a really shitty year. We both lost uh, people very close to us. So earlier in the year, my husband lost his loved one. And then later in the year, I ended up losing my loved one. 
But I lost my loved one the day before we were going to go see him. Like the day before our flight. Um, It was my grandfather. And I remember on my way out of work, um, I get texts, like a slew of texts that are like, oh, come home, take an Uber home, blah, blah, blah. Because I usually take the bus home or walk. And then I get a message from some my aunt and she was like, oh, Luke says you need to go home <laughs> or, or something like that. And I call her and I'm like, is he gone? And la dee da dee da we don't need to go too deep into that. But when I got home, I had a, we had a friend over and we, we talked for a little bit, but obviously I was really upset and Luke needed to, to sleep as well. So a couple hours later, Luke ended up going to sleep and that cat did not leave my side until we left for the, the, the airport yeah. and she did. She, okay. So here's the thing about me. There are only certain people that I hug in life. I'm not the biggest hugger. I'm not a touchy feely person. I do feel a lot, <laughs> but I'm not like, um, the, the biggest touchy person. And she knew that sometimes. And I think she felt in that moment that laying by my feet the entire night and occasionally looking up at me was the best thing to do. And every time I like went to like get a drink of water or something like that, she would stare at me as I was doing it. And then she would stay there and I would get back to sitting down and she would, she would still be by my feet. And that is, that is how amazing that cat was. So there was a time when Mary was upset about something. I can't remember what it was now. Um, but Isis just kind of came in the room, looked around, went, hmm, and then went in the kitchen. <laughs> and then she came back with a little mini scotch egg in her mouth that she had <laughs> fished out of the shopping bag that was on the counter. And she's like, Rrr. Yep, dropped it at Mary's feet. And as Mary just did, went, Rrr. Like she was bringing Mary a gift to cheer her up. <laughs> and the only thing she could think of was food. <laughs> yeah. She'd never done that before. No, she'd never done that. She'd never did it again. No. But uh, that was the, the kindest thing she'd ever done. Yeah. Having Isis in my life was beautiful, especially when she came into my life. It was at the perfect time because I had demons going on in my head you know that I didn't quite know how to to deal with them and you know being alone in the apartment wasn't something that was healthy and I am not as much as I want to be a social butterfly I am not I've always wanted to be one when I was younger but as I've gotten older I have realized that I don't I don't need to have you know, a huge group of friends. I could have a small group of friends and my cats. <laughs> and when Isis came into my life, although at first she just didn't, she was very indifferent to everything. Mm-hmm. It was still somebody that I, that was there. And then when she really started to realize that I loved her and, you know, she started loving me back, it was like, well, I've, I've had friends before, but friends that were just unconditional. That's mm-hmm. what it was. Unconditional. That is the true <laughs> definition of unconditional is, is ISIS. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. This story was even longer than I thought it was going to be. Well, I'll, I'll wrap the story up then. Yeah. So in 2019, uh, one day we noticed ISIS had a big lump on her throat. Yeah. And we took her to the vets. They said, oh, it's nothing to worry about. We'll send it off to get tested. We'll take some blood samples, send it off to get tested, and we'll let you know. The vets called us back and said, yeah, nothing to worry about. We'll just see if we can remove it. So we took her in, and the on-duty vet took one look at her and went, no, no, that's a tumour. That is definitely a tumour. Yeah. So we took her to another vet's for a second opinion. They confirmed the second diagnosis and told us that we needed to have her put down. But we kept her for as long as she was able to eat. Yeah. The day that she turned her nose up at her food and refused to eat it is the day we booked her 
euthanasia. It was very sad seeing her coming in to eat. She put her face down, opened her mouth and just went, ugh, turned around and walked away and just laid down and she didn't get up again. And I, <laughs> the funniest thing, the funniest thing about um, that whole situation is her last act on the planet. <laughs> I'm trying to have a happy moment at the end here. It's not happy for me, but it's it'll make people laugh. Yeah. So obviously Mary was holding her when she was put down and we saw the light go out in her eyes. And Mary handed her to me and I was just cradling her and holding her, stroking her because, you know, I'd heard that cats can, when they die, they can still hear for a little while. So I was just talking to her and stroking her in case she could feel it. And then she pissed everywhere, <laughs> yeah. all over me. I got soaked in cat piss. Yeah. And I was like, this is your last act on the planet. And it is so absolutely in character. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Isis. Yeah. And um, we had her cremated and we've got her in a little urn. She's actually here in my office with me. Yeah. Um, we keep her on a high shelf away from the new boy, Gilgamesh, because he likes to <laughs> knock things over. Mine. <laughs> yeah. And if he knocked her urn over, I'd knock his head off. Oh. Um, but then uh, after we'd we'd had her euthanized, I had to go to Primark and buy a cheap T-shirt, yeah. <laughs> wandering around the high street stinking of cat piss. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I tell you, as sad, as sad as that was, that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was one of the easiest things is to make the decision to, you know, let her go. But one of the hardest things to do was to go through that whole thing because it, it's just, this is just the little story. Although it sounds really long, this is just the small story of Isis. Isis yeah. meant so much to me. And even to this day, I, I, I see a blanket or I see something that she liked or I'll see a tuna can <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just kind of break down inside because I miss her. Mm -hmm. But... At the end of the day, we lose loved ones and we lose pets. Mm -hmm. We lose moms, we lose dads. But I really like to remember her for, other than Luke, giving me the first feeling of unconditional love. But yeah, she had a whole life before she met us. But I like to think that we gave her a very good last seven years or so of her life. We don't actually know how old she was. They estimated that she was two years old when we got her. But I think she was older than that. Yeah. Because bless her heart, she was missing a couple of her teeth, wasn't she? Like on the bottom row. Oh. Almost all gummy. And uh, that usually happens with older cats. All right, let's actually talk about... <laughs> By the way, I like to think that Isis was my favorite, is my favorite. Catwoman's cat Isis or our cat Isis? My cat Isis was my favorite DC animated, <laughs> animated series. Yeah, I mean, I think Isis is one of the best original creations from that show to bring it on topic half an hour in <laughs> <laughs> um so i know that she was designed like the look of the character was designed by kevin altieri who was the director of that episode and i've heard a couple of podcasts with him recently where he has specifically gone out of his way to mention that he goes by the way i designed isis i'm really proud of that i love that cat <laughs> and he's damn right to be proud because i yeah. love that cat as well the in the episode cat scratch fever when roland daggett has his rubbish henchman rounding up strays and they kidnap Isis and give her a virus. Oh, it boils my blood. It does. It makes me grind my teeth. <laughs> yeah, by the time this podcast comes out, I'll have done a video that talks a little bit about Roland Daggett and how he's one of the most evil characters in the whole show. Completely irredeemable. Uh, so go and watch that if you haven't already. Um, but, yeah, there's something in the the cartoon version of isis that is just so incredibly loyal and affectionate and she's very talented as well yes um i know that she is used to do crimes <laughs> like stealing jewelry from elderly women um <laughs> by going in through their windows and avoiding their security lights i'm not security lights security lasers excuse me i'm not sure if cats actually can see 
uh, invisible lasers. Maybe they can. I don't you know. You shut up. Cats can do anything, right? Yeah. Thing is, cats can do anything, but for the most part, cats don't want to do anything. Well, they can't text. I bet they could. They, they just don't be. want to. That's true. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, other than Isis, who is an excellent cat, and it's a shame that they didn't use her very much in the new Batman adventures, which other pets come out high on your list? I know who's high on mine. So, I have written a small list of the... the I'm not going to say basic pets, but I'm going to say the pets that I remember mm -hmm. um, and that I looked up. Because there are some that have names that are different in the comics mm -hmm. um, than in the TV show. So, obviously, my favorite one is going to be Isis. Mm -hmm. Let's be real. But if other than Isis, it's definitely Ace. Yes, I'd actually forgotten we were going to talk about Ace the dog, yeah. not Ace the child. Yeah. <laughs> um, and someone made a, a comment, actually, about this, and we'll probably get to it a bit later on. But they were saying, well, I thought that the name Ace for the dog was a direct reference to Ace the Bat Hound from the 50s comics. And it absolutely is. But the in-universe explanation is that Bruce Wayne has named his loyal, fierce guard dog after the little girl Ace that died in his presence. Yeah beautiful very sentimental old man old man bruce wayne what a weirdo <laughs> we love weirdos um bud and lou but bud and lou's kind of like the they're the the they're hyenas but i think of them as the dogs that like the person across the street has that just won't shut up mm -hmm. we still love them but they're kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah, they don't really have very much personality other than they're loyal to Harley. That they they snap at the Joker after he kicks Harley out and Harley and Ivy. That's, and he's like, I love that. <laughs> um, we also have I said Isis, Bud and Lou, Ace, Streaky. Now Streaky is a very sweet cat. Now in the comics, mm -hmm. Streaky is a super pet, so yeah. it can fly. Uh, I think Streaky's a boy. I'm not certain now off the top of my head. They. Let's yeah. use they. All right, yeah. It doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? Yeah. Streaky can fly, and they have superpowers. But in the uh, the, the cartoons, it's just the Kent family pet cat. It's named a ginger cat with, like, a white streak on it across its spine. And I think the most memorable episode that Streaky appears in is Comfort and Joy from Justice yes, League. Yes, one of my favourite episodes. Yeah, when Superman brings the Martian Manhunter to the Kent family yeah. farm to spend Christmas together. And obviously he's a Martian, he doesn't really get it. Um, he doesn't have any festive traditions of his own, so he's just kind of coming yeah. along for the ride. And Streaky is initially very hostile towards him. Like you were? Yeah, like What's hisses at him and, and so on. But by the end of the episode, after John has kind of... He's been around Smallville. He's just been watching people go about their lives and seeing them help each other and just be... He, he bathes in the festive spirit and he shares a Martian song. And he's just kind of sat there on the bay yeah. window. Streaky sat on his lap purring and he's stroking Streaky and singing his song. I think Streaky came to eventually because um, Jean, uh, it was in his natural form as well. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe the cat could sense that he was in disguise yeah. and being like, mm, be yourself. Yeah, and I always took that. But then that's that's the lovely thing is that there's so many interpretations of that. Yeah. But the thing is with cats, they can see through your BS. <laughs> they do say that cats can sense evil. They, Yeah, believe me, I know. I know. Yeah. And uh, just as an aside, not saying anything here really, but... Cats love me, regardless. Dogs do as well. <laughs> Animals in general really love me, and I think it's weird because I, I don't really like dogs personally. I've got, you know, I don't dislike them, but you know, if you said to me, "What's your ideal pet?" I'd go a massive cat. My my dog, by the way, he's not he's not even exaggerating. Animals love him. Yeah. But I had a dog back in Oklahoma named Gandalf. Oh, yeah. And he was a teacup Maltese, and he was a tiny little thing. And a yappy little thing as well. Mm -hmm. He was not fond of men, but he loved Luke. Yeah. What's he loved trying to say? Him. What's he trying to say? He loved him. <laughs> no, I think um, I was given Gandalf by a friend of mine. And 
I think Gandalf just knew women more, mm -hmm. to be honest. And he knew you and my grandpa, and that was really yeah. it. Yeah, he liked your granddad as oh, well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Although my granddad was very indifferent to him sometimes. Or yeah. well, so was I. He yeah. Kind of, he kind of annoyed me most of the time, to be honest. Yeah. Anyways. Anyway, yeah, sorry, we straying too far um, into the personal realm again. We also have Crypto. Yeah, so we're not talking about Crypto the Super Dog. No, we're talking about Crypto Bizarro's... What is Crypto? I don't actually know what species he is. He's, he's this weird little kind of mossy green sharp tooth cute thingy i mean you think he's cute yeah. he, he's he's a monster and he tries to kill bizarro but I obviously knew. bizarro has super tough skin so yeah to him it's a it's a the bites are a, are a tickle so he's like oh crypto me best friend or me, me worst friend. enemy <laughs> whatever bizarro says that's how i think gilly talks by yeah, the way yeah. <laughs> Best <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but i think crypto is um i thought that was a very nice touch having you know his his faithful pet be this murderous yeah <laughs> demonic looking thing but he treats it like as if it were you know a, a dog yeah they're mr freeze's polar bears from sub-zero now i am slightly torn on them because it is very much leaning into Mr. Freeze's cold gimmick and it kind of reminds me of you know the Adam West show not that their version of Mr. Freeze ever had polar bears but you know having having animals that follow commands I don't know it just doesn't quite sit right with me but I think it's very well done I think that Mr. Freeze having pets, I think that's the only way he would have them, is that he would be able to give them commands and they would have to be able to, to follow that the way that he wants. I just think that's kind of in his personality, but that might just be me. Yeah, I mean, maybe. He is very much a control freak. But he he does show them affection, at least before um, Nora gets uh, rudely awoken, let's put it that way, because he, he goes hunting for fish with them and I believe he gives them some fish. When we talk about the pets, we also need to talk about the Fortress of Solitude, mm -hmm. the the quote unquote zoo in there. Mm -hmm. So we had a comment from Bookworm asking about this. In my opinion, the Fortress of Solitude is a place that Superman shares with these creatures. These creatures are not his pets. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that he would have an emotional connection with them. Maybe some of them. But. Yeah, maybe some of them, but not to an extent of here, boy, or blah, blah, blah. Maybe the dodo. Yeah. In the last man. <laughs> but uh, I, the, I, sorry, excuse me, the main man. I said the last man. I think he is just giving them a safe space to continue their species. Not necessarily to have like thousands of pets. I think the Fortress of Solitude is kind of one of those places where. He doesn't have to have the pets. The pets or the creatures can just, just live there. Yes, it's not like he set out to gather up these animals yeah. and, and look after them. It's just through circumstance that he ended yeah. up with them. He could have left them on the curator's ship, but they probably would have died. So mm -hmm. he's like, all right, I'm taking them. They come into my fortress of solitude where they can live in peace and harmony. And yeah. I'll make sure that they continue to live. And that kind of leads on to oh sustainable way of of living for them he yeah. gives them a sustainable way of living that that's what right I was looking for keeps them safe from poachers and predators and so on but that leads on to one of those creatures from his zoo <laughs> you know who i'm going to talk yeah. about starro oh i don't that is the episode that i dislike the most what the batman beyond one with starro well it's not that i dislike it as in like oh i hate it it's the fact that we're talking about Starro, the one that goes on the face, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you just don't like the idea of it? No. Like, if a, if, if any creature did that to me, I'd be like, no thanks. Yeah, and it's not just that it goes on your yeah. face. It takes over your mind as well. Yeah, that's the thing. I yeah. don't. We don't do mind control in this household. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I thought it was a really good episode. I think it's The Call, uh, the, the episodes of Batman Beyond. It's a two-part story. Really good. Very well made. I mean, Batman Beyond in general is, is a very well made cartoon. It's very clean, very polished. Yes. Often quite disturbing. Yeah. And I suppose that kind of ties into what you were saying a minute ago about the idea of this 
this starfish with suckers like Blech. latching onto your face Blech. or in superman's case it was on his chest under yeah. his, his uniform and just controlling everything you do no um yeah i mean i thought it was a great Not episode. In this lifetime it's one of my favorite ones actually no it is a great episode i just don't like out of out of all of the characters other than the ventriloquist it's one of the most disturbing ones Mm-hmm. To me, as in on a on a personal level, anyway. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'm going to move on to. I know I shouldn't be saying this, but it's my favorite comment from the past couple of weeks. So we have a listener called Screenwiper. So Screenwiper has a chicken named Blue, and Blue wasn't feeling so well recently, to the point that it wasn't looking great. And I would like to say. A big, you go girl, to Blue, because she seems to be getting better. Screen Wiper gave us the best update and said that Blue the chicken was on the up and up. And I have to say that made my entire week when I saw that. I was like, you know what? This could be a bad week. It's not. But hearing that news is great because Blue's also going to help train some other hens soon. So get her to work once she's better. <laughs> yeah, important caveat. Once she's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I am so happy to hear that Blue is doing well. And is we, we have to have pictures, by the way. So send us some pictures. I don't know how they will send the pictures. Uh, if you use... Oh, what, what social media have you set up for the podcast, <laughs> Mary? That's a good segue, isn't it? Yeah. So, Screen Wiper, if you want to contact us and tag us on threads of some pictures of Blue the Chicken, you don't have to, but if you want to, uh, all of our details on how to get a hold of us on threads, TikTok, Instagram, all of that good stuff will be in the description box. So, should we move to the other comments now, Mary? Uh, yeah, if you can bring them up on screen. That. So, SR Striker said that they had mixed feelings about Terry McGuinness being Bruce Wayne's son. So, I'm referring to last episode where we were talking about the Justice League Unlimited episode of Epilogue. And they said, well, it's because I don't feel comfortable about Terry being Bruce's son, by the way, that he was made. Because I don't think Bruce's parents wanting grandchildren out of wedlock. Which I don't know if Terry counts as an illegitimate son, because I see Bruce having his children in wedlock rather than out. Which is one of the reasons why I don't like Damian Wayne so much. Because I would honestly rather have Helena Wayne in Batman Beyond, because it could be some potential in there that she is Bruce's only child to the public. I mean, do you remember your response? You said that you didn't think that they would have loved Terry any less Oh yeah, did I write? Because, did I actually comment on that? Yeah, you said oh, grandparents. Awesome. You said grandparents usually have yeah. unconditional love, and uh, Zemox responded, "Unless one of the grandparents is Rachel Ghoul. <laughs> <laughs> which that's no. that gave me a good laugh. That is so, a good laugh. With this particular comment, I I have to I have to repeat what I said as well. Is I think there are bigger problems in the world to worry about, and I know this is just um, we're talking about the animated series here and and all of this, and that's that's what we're we're doing. We're talking about it, but as someone who <laughs> uh, my mother and father were not married uh, mm-hmm. when I was born. I'm going to say I was going to end up the same way no matter what. And my grandparents loved me unconditionally because they were the ones that raised me. So in the end, it didn't matter that my mother wasn't married. So next uh, comment came from Braxton Vincent, who said, keep the podcast coming. I'm loving it. Well, here we go. It's got another one. Your wish is our command. Zemox rears his head again with uh, this quite a long comment about his thoughts on the events of Epilogue. I think I'll just read the last paragraph where he says, Personally, I see Epilogue as the final chapter to DCAU Batman. The final chapter for the entire DCAU was the two-part series finale of Justice League Unlimited and the final shot of all the heroes running down the steps. He has a question for us, though, Mary. Okay. If Two-Face had a pet, what kind of animal would it be? I'll go first with my response. Mm -hmm. And my guess, my guess, (laughs) my proposal is that Two-Face would have a toucan. <laughs> nah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. So I am I'm not completely sure. I don't think Two Face should have a cat <laughs> or a dog or any pet for that matter. <laughs> I don't know. Um maybe that 
like a like a gecko or something that can that's like has that kind of duality thing going on what like a, a one that changes color yeah hmm. that's not a gecko chameleon chameleon that's what i'm talking about not gecko this isn't the gecko insurance <laughs> uh okay so next comment was from david carney hey dave I just watched Batman Mask of the Phantasm for the first time a few months ago. For me, it's the best DCAU movie ever made. I agree. Kevin Conroy's performance is outstanding. For Crisis on Infinite Earths, I hope they don't use AI voice for Kevin Conroy. Me too. I'm sure they wouldn't. I don't think they will. They better not. No, I don't think they... I'll write a white woman email. I don't think they'd disrespect him like that. Uh, And he says, keep up the great work. So I I hope you're still listening and that you enjoyed this. Uh, next comment from R083RT, who looks like has a Transformers uh, avatar. Robots in disguise. Mm-hmm. So talking about epilogue again. Not sure if it is official or fan theory, but I heard that part of the reason Terry's parents divorced is because after Warren McGuinness had witnessed Mary had two children with black hair, Warren assumed that Mary was having an affair. That kind of adds a bit of tragedy to the whole thing with Amanda Waller, causing the divorce between what would have presumably been a loving family. Now, I'm not sure if that was ever mentioned in like the DC Animated Universe. It sounds like something they would have done in like the mainline comic books, maybe. But the thing I would say, not necessarily to disprove that, but to argue against it, maybe, is the fact that Terry lived with Warren. If Warren felt that those children weren't his... He probably wouldn't have taken Terry in. Probably. He might still have. But um, I I don't subscribe to that view. But I can see why people might think that. And I'm not necessarily saying it's wrong. It's just it doesn't fit my personal headcanon. What about you, Mary? What are your thoughts? I have none. Okay. Because I, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't really see it that way. So somebody else brings this up as well, actually. It's the Athul Magia. I think I'm saying that right. Blue Magic? Yeah, Blue Magic. Or Blue Magician, possibly. My Spanish is very rusty, excuse me. Bueno. (laughs) Excellent. While I understand the point of the episode was to say that Terry was his own man and didn't have to be Bruce Wayne to be Batman, I feel the entirety of Batman Beyond made that point already. Having him literally be Batman's son just sort of made the point again feel redundant. It also makes me feel sorry for Terry's parents because they lived separately at the start of the series, implying they might have been divorced. With the knowledge that Mary had unknowingly had someone else's child, it's entirely possible that the reason is for, or was for, perceived infidelity. Yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, so in my head, the reason why they weren't together in the beginning, here's my thing. They don't mention this, but here's the the scenario in my head. The dad was working too much, never had time for her for the mom and the mom was like no i could do better Hmm. Uh, blah 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 you need to move out he moves out then the story starts that's how i perceived it in my head not that there was like Hmm. infidelity yeah i think they just had irreconcilable differences yeah that was always my take on it yeah i don't know rdp 16 rules says excellent podcast this episode has always been one of the those rare animated stories that immediately hits you in the feels kind of like that episode of futurama with seymour i agree I mary doesn't like one. futurama but i don't know what that one it's fine you'll never watch it so it's okay okay i'm very excited for the super pets conversation before the movie i feel like they weren't talked about as much as their hero counterparts this is very true i think most people kind of viewed it as being kind of silly and i think part of the reason why they weren't talked about as much is because they didn't really make it over to the animated shows because they tried to have a bit more of a realistic air to them yeah. and kind of having a flying cat and a flying dog just might have seemed a bit preposterous but you know it's, it's a show about a guy who flies and shoots lasers from his eyes so maybe <laughs> maybe that's preposterous enough um but they also had two questions a few hashtag totally shway questions totally shway first one have you seen the alternate michael keaton timeline series produced by channel awesome as bat fans i feel like you would really enjoy them i have not neither have i i haven't seen them i don't know anything about them but i'll look them up after this this. is one of those things that we're gonna be like because i have work tomorrow we're gonna lay in bed and just watch on the tv tonight (laughs) so next question have you seen my adventure with superman yet if so, which Green Lantern do you think should be introduced in it first, assuming the Green Lanterns appear at all? Mary has not watched My Adventures with Superman. It's on Max. Okay. It's a new cartoon. It's very anime-inspired. Um, 
What's his face? Is it Jack Quaid? The the younger Quaid? The youngest Quaid? No idea. Rand, no, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't. One of their sons. He, he voices Dennis Clark Kent. Dennis is the Superman. best. <laughs> I think it's Dennis Quaid's son. I could be completely wrong. But he's part of the Quaid family. Okay. He's in The Boys as well. Um, but okay. he voices I'll give it a, Superman. I'll give it a watch. Um, I've seen people moaning about it because of perceived slights like oh race swapping why is jimmy olsen black why, why is not? why is lois lane racially ambiguous ruh, ruh, ruh. why not yeah exactly why not it doesn't matter at all all right i'm i'm gonna say this right here right now as someone who comes from a background of lots of things because i'm american what does it matter if if the flash is white or if superman is white or if he was black or if he was brown like wouldn't that be amazing if we had a middle eastern looking superman yeah i mean that certainly wouldn't be a problem i think yeah. you could write some very interesting stories actually about exactly. that exactly particularly if he was in the us where i mean it's not just the us it's know, a US lot of the western the world corporate uh, where there's quite rampant Islamophobia. Yeah. Like, what would that? What would happen there? Now, the thing is, race is only important if it is a core tenant of the character's being. Yeah. Like the Black Panther, he has to be black. He yeah. has because he's from Africa. He yeah. is African. But pff, I don't know. Uh, Jimmy Olsen doesn't have yeah, to be a white boy. Jimmy Olsen doesn't have to be. No. Doesn't have and to be. You at know all. what? That woman. Still pissed off about them deleting that. <laughs> Cancelling it. Yes. Um, but to answer the question, so I've watched it. I I think it's quite well made. I don't to be honest, I'm a bit I don't really like shows that lean heavily into like anime art style because I feel like they're pandering to, you know I can just see an executive going, Kids love anime, therefore this show must look like an anime. It's trendy. Yeah, and ugh, I don't really like anime that much to be honest. Um, a lot of Japanese anime is like very cheaply produced, and I just can't get past the not very good animation or bad voice acting, particularly when it's dubbed. The dubbing is often awful. Batman ruined it for you. <laughs> well, yeah, but then again, Batman was made by a lot of the same yeah. Japanese studios. Like Studio Ghibli, or Ghibli, however you say Ghibli. it. Ghibli. Studio Ghibli, they animated Growing Pains, which is one of my favorite episodes. So I know when you say Growing Pains, I know what you're talking about. But I keep thinking about the um, the TV show Growing Pains when you say that. I'm like, why is he talking about this? <laughs> that's nothing no. you would watch. So that's, that's a funny thing, actually. It's a really cool story for, with Growing Pains in that in order to meet the production deadlines, the team at Warner Brothers actually gave the animation studios in Japan that the, the full responsibility for making the show. So doing the storyboards, doing the layouts, painting the animation cells, filming it, editing it. Normally those first couple of steps would be handled by the US team and then they'd send it off to Japan or Korea to get animated. Now, the problem was TMS, the studio yeah. that animated them, that was given this responsibility, they didn't have the manpower to do it. So they ended up roping in people from Studio Ghibli <laughs> to to um, to finish the job. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because TMS had helped Studio Ghibli get, I think it was Princess Mononoke, is that what it's called? I don't uh, know. Yeah, well, sorry, I'm asking the audience, so not that I'll be able to hear their response, but basically that, that was a very troubled production. They needed to bring TMS to help them get it over the finish line, and they had a verbal agreement that, okay, when we need help, you will help us out. Scratching the back. Yeah, so with the Superman episodes, World's Finest, that they brought Ghibli on to animate, they just kind of finished it off, essentially. Mm -hmm. TMS staff did most of the work, and then... Um, had the Ghibli stuff finish it off but with Growing Pains it was almost the opposite they had someone from TMS go to the Ghibli office to work with the Ghibli team and say right here's the the layouts that we're going to do now we need to paint it now we need to record it and blah 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 and uh, there's a really good YouTube video about this um, by a guy called Steve Um Steve Um Skyrim. Steve Um with an M so Steve M but his name's Steve Um Oh, Steve M. I've heard of yeah. him. Yeah, so he does a lot of anime videos. He's he's done a video called um, like Ghibli's Batman. Look that up and watch it if you haven't already. It's really fascinating. I think I've, I've, um, I've, you've been watching them and I've watched them at yeah. the same time. Uh, and I just got massively sidetracked because the question I was going to answer is about which Green Lantern should they introduce. And I think they should do one of the newer Green Lanterns. Um, maybe Jessica Cruz or Teen Lantern, maybe. 
Um, you could do John Stewart again, and that'd be fine. You could do Guy Gardner, that'd be okay. You can do Hal Jordan, even. Yeah, you know who fine. my favorite is? John Stewart. Yes. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I would do. Uh, but I don't think Green Lantern's going to turn up because the, my adventures with Superman has him facing off with a lot of very like tech heavy villains. Like all, most of the villains get their powers through alien technology, which I'm sure they're going to reveal is Kryptonian technology. Spoilers, if well, that happens to be true. <laughs> it's just a, just a guess on my part. But anyway, yeah, decent show. If you can watch it, you should watch it. Uh, if you're getting upset about them changing characters' race, why? Why? Just, you're you're in the wrong universe. <laughs> I'm just going to well. say that right now. You were in the wrong universe. And, and honestly, I'm going to say this right here, right now. Get over it. Keeping that one in. Yeah, and I'm certain that nobody that listens to our show really gets that upset about it. They might just go, mm, but that's it. Uh, okay, so next question from SPD Magenta Ranger. Magenta Ranger? You're yep. a Power Ranger. Looks like it. Yeah. Yo, yo, yo. Just started listening and you are awesome. Question for next time. What superhero did you wish got a DCAU series? Not ones that were already in the show, but those who were unadapted. Oh, no. Okay, so... This is tough. Because every time I think of one, I go, nope, they were in Justice League. Yeah, uh, nope. Justice League Unlimited. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nope. I was going to say Clarion the Witch Boy, but nope, Clarion was in Batman. Uh, New Batman Adventures. Um, I'm stumped because, again, I've... Uh, well, I've got one then. I'm going to go with Blue Beetle. Uh, could be the Ted Cord version. I think that would have been nice seeing him playing off Booster Gold. Um, but I'd be just as happy with Jaime Reyes as well. Um, so, yeah, that's my pick. It's very difficult for me to think of anyone because, as we were just saying, almost everybody was in um, the you know Justice League or Justice League Unlimited yeah, uh, yeah. Even even someone like Swamp Thing, who I was going to say, he was. I think he was in a, a background cameo character. Yeah. He was definitely. I'm pretty certain Swamp Thing was there on the Watchtower in the first episode in the background, but they just never used him. Hmm. So Screenwiper came back and said that he thought that the Terry is Bruce's son thing is convoluted. Warren McGuinness being such a simp for Bruce Wayne is realistic enough when in real life billionaires like Elon Musk have simps. Awful people, but real people. Um, but having your sperm somehow genetically altered so that it's a clone of some other guys is bloody stupid. Well, if it was something he did op um, of his own free will, then yeah, I would agree with you. Zehanot 10 says, Terry's story as a former criminal trying to atone by being the new Batman was good enough. No need for the he's Bruce's son retcon. That's fair enough. Fair. They also said, what Joker did to Tim is what I think caused Bruce to leave the Justice League and push Barbara and Tim away. Yes, I agree. Then Alfred probably died at some point before Beyond. Then Bruce having to point a gun at a thug to defend himself made him quit being Batman entirely. Word. Yes. Uh, we already talked about Bookworm's comment, didn't we? Yes. So Captain Alces says, Loving the podcast epilogue was a great episode for many reasons, and while I have mixed feelings about Terry being Bruce's biological son, it sounds exactly like something Walla would do, and her conversation with Terry is spectacular writing. And finally, from Iron Bison, two things from me, and I don't mean to sound like an asshole. You don't. It's fine. But Ace in Batman Beyond could be an homage to the Royal Flush member, Ace. But Ace the Bat Hound was a character introduced back in the 50s, and I always thought Ace in Beyond was a callback to that. This is the comment I mentioned earlier. I'm glad we came to this. Also, to flash back to the first episode of the podcast on The Flash, I always thought it was Barry in Superman the Animated Series, simply because during some of his scenes, bits of the 90s Flash theme would play in the background. What are your thoughts? Now, I'll tell you why the bit of the 90s Flash TV show music played in the background. Mm -hmm. you, I'm sure you know why, Mary. Good. Because Shirley Walker composed <laughs> the music for the Flash TV show, and it was obviously a little reference to that. A little homage to herself, yeah. if you will. I don't know if she did the music for that episode, actually. I think it might have been Lolita Ritmanis off the top of my head. I'm probably wrong, though. But it's it, it's a reference to yeah. Shirley Walker's previous work. And obviously Shirley Walker is a titan of DC animated series music. And just DC stuff in general. Um, So she composed Batman with Danny Elfman. Yeah, yeah. She worked on Tim Burton's Batman. Yeah. I don't know if she worked on Batman Returns, though, because I think she was busy with Batman the Animated Series. But she definitely worked on, oh, on Batman. Danny Elfman. Johnny Depp, Johnny Depp. Blinky, blonky, blinky, blinky. Boom, boom, boom. Bottom corner, bottom corner. Yeah, so that's some typical 
Danny Elfman music. And you notice, I'm not to take any swipes at Danny Elfman, but you notice when he's not working with Shirley Walker, his music is more generic. But um, <clears> excuse <throat> me, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. Watch your mouth. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that. Watch your Shirley mouth. Walker did a lot of work with Danny Elfman to elevate his music. Okay, so I'm, I'm currently re-watching Desperate Housewives, although I love Desperate Housewives in the first run as well. I always forget he did the theme tune. And then, well, make fun of me all you will, but I like the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise. And Danny Elfman did the, you know, the theme for, for that. Like the, like some of the, he composed some of it. I don't remember what the music sounded like in Fifty Shades of Grey. It's very... Forgettable, it sounds like. No, <laughs> it's not Batman. No, it's not. <laughs> it would be kind of weird if you turn that movie on, you know, with, with all of that. Plinky, plinky, I have unconventional tastes. Disney movie, Disney movie. As yeah. you can see, we have thought about Danny Elfman music a lot. Yeah, I mean, we watched the Men in Black movies the other day, and he did oh, the, yeah. the music for them. Yeah, um, anyways, we're we're getting off, aren't we? Th- this is a whole other topic of conversation. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll just say it now. It's not. I don't think it's going to be the next episode because our guest had to cancel last minute. Probably the episode afterwards, but we're going to talk about Shirley Walker's music in the yeah. future. Um, and I don't think you can. In, in this sphere, I don't think you can talk about um, Shirley Walker's music without talking about uh, people that were influenced by Shirley Walker. Yeah. As well. Like Danny Elfman. Yeah, well. yeah. I mean, Danny Elfman might argue that he influenced her, but I don't think I agree with that. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's all the comments. So all that's left to say is next time. So next time, I'm hoping we'll have a guest on the show. I think the next one is going to be about Tim Burton's influence on the DC animated universe. Oh, word. Yeah, because I was recently on a podcast called Bat Minute. Oh, check now, it out, guys. Please, please check it out. That's really good. Yeah, even if you just go listen to my episode. All the other episodes are good as well. <laughs> They're very I'll, I'll, good. Don't I'll, just listen to his. <laughs> I'll explain the premise of the show. So basically, they watch a movie and each roughly hour long episode is dedicated to one minute at a time and they work through the movie sequentially so you know they've they this is like their fifth season and they're covering batman mask of the phantasm so i came on to talk about the 48th minute which starts with uh bruce bleeding from the head jumping in andrea's convertible spoilers as she drives away and harvey bullock stands there sweating and i made the joke to them that i thought it was very funny that about 10 20 percent of my minute was taken up by harvey bullock standing there sweating profusely (laughs) Um, but then it's the uh, bruce and andrea getting back to to wayne manor and starting to talk about what's happened um but it was a good show i enjoyed being on it and i've invited one of the hosts to come and talk to us next time about tim burton's uh influence on the animated series and the the entire DC animated universe because he he just kicked off the whole thing really with the success of Batman it's basically why Warner Brothers agreed to invest in in their animation studios. Can I ask our audience a question? Yes. What would you guys like us to talk about? I know I have some ideas. I'm not running out of ideas, but what well, is there anything that you guys would like? us to have a specific podcast about or maybe like a special yep we could I, do a special. <laughs> I would welcome topics uh suggestions as well as as mary said we're not running out of ideas at all we've got loads to talk about i've got at least i mean i've mapped out the next sort of two three months i spent 30 minutes talking about my cat isis <laughs> i loved every minute of it yeah and we're going to try and get guests to come on as well My plans for the rest of the week are to work and we're going to go see Barbie because I didn't get to see Barbie when it first came out because I had um, I had a surgery on my nose. It wasn't a rhinoplasty, by the way. I love the way my nose looks. But unfortunately, I couldn't go see it. So I'm going to go see it tomorrow. By the time this episode airs, you'll have seen it. Yes, I'm so excited. I I could just have a whole podcast about Barbie. (laughs) So this is the announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Next time on Totally Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. Mary's spin-off podcast, Totally yeah. Barbie. All right. Anyways, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you have a brilliant time. And 
let's do something together and hug our pets, give them cuddles and kisses. And if you want to tag us in any pictures of your pets, please do. Our All of our, our socials are in the description box. I'll just read them out as well. Mary's made a TikTok account called Totally Shway Podcast. I've made a Threads and an Instagram. I believe those are both Totally Shway Podcast. Just trying to find it. Uh, yes, they are. Yeah, it's Totally Shway Podcast. And yeah, you can also like comment obviously on luke's youtube and everything like that but if you want to like ask us some questions or whatever i will say this both luke and i do work we do have jobs so if we don't get back to you straight away we will get back to you just might take a couple of hours or maybe a day or two Mm -hmm. but we will get back to you yep appreciate every piece of interaction really helps yeah um (sighs) I guess one last thing I wanted to say is that my at the time of recording my latest video was about the duplicates from Batman the animated series the thing that really I I think the thing that made it really special is I was given access to the storyboards for that episode by the artist Brad Raider uh and he shared with me the original planned ending for that episode that didn't get made it features a battle between Batman and a duplicate Batman Now, it wasn't made because they didn't have the time for it. They basically cut it out entirely. But then they went on to do the episode His Silicon Soul, which was inspired by by these scenes. This scene has never been shared anywhere else prior to this. They, They weren't available publicly. And I'm so grateful that Brad gave me the permission to make a little video about them and share them with you. I want to do more things like this, but I can't really do it. I can't justify it unless people watch unless people engage with it so if you haven't watched it already because you you do have a full-time job as well yeah yeah i do have a full-time job i'm doing all of this as a side thing um as a hobby yeah it's a great thing because you also get interaction with with people that with the same interest it's awesome but i tell you what that is such a great way to connect to like a childhood like achievement type thing Mm -hmm. you get like that type thing like somebody gave you the the opportunity to to share these and it, it's just amazing to me that that happened that you got to see that alternate ending yeah, yeah. um brad has given me the storyboards for 10 episodes and i'm gonna do more storyboard videos because he liked it that's the most important thing yeah he told me he really liked it and some of these storyboards have little tiny bits that were cut out so there's nothing really as significant like there's a a little bit more violence in the two-face part one storyboards for act three summer gleason's featured a little bit more in feet of clay part two there so there won't be anything as significant as as this heart of steel part two deleted scene but i'm going to share them anyway because i i personally detest gatekeeping and I really think that the artwork on these shows was absolutely amazing and more people should be able to see them and enjoy them. And that's becoming my little mission in life to unearth as much of this content as I can, share it with as many people as I can so that it will live on forever. Because it breaks my heart that some of these people working on these shows have died. And with them their knowledge and their creativity gone okay we've still got the final products and that's great but when you think about the thousands and thousands of drawings that would be done for each episode each character that are just completely lost to time yeah it's oh, it makes me sick to my stomach so i'm doing what i can to try and help out and i think next year i'm going to get really serious about doing bigger projects around this kind of thing don't want to over promise but that's that's my mission next year so that's it guys that's the podcast for this week again i hope you have a wonderful day night morning whatever time you're listening to this and remember go shui (laughs)